Philip Smith, I'm Vice Chancellor for Institutional Advancement at Baton Rouge Community College. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Dr. Willie E. Smith, our Chancellor, to our series of discussions on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'd like to thank our special guests for being with us today. We have Bakari Sellers, noted author, attorney, commentator, and former politician. Our Mayor President, Sharon Weston Broom, City of Baton Rouge and East Baton Rouge Parish. We have our own Dr. Willie E. Smith, Chancellor, Baton Rouge Community College. From IBM, Grace Sue, Vice President for Education, Corporate and Social Responsibility. We have Dr. Johan Uven, former Assistant Secretary, Department of Education and CEO of IEL. And we have Dr. John B. King, former U.S. Secretary for Education, and CEO now of Education Trust. Thank you for being here. Greetings everyone, my name is Ty Mitchell and I serve as Baton Rouge Community College's Student Government Association President and I would like to welcome you to this fireside chat on diversity, equity, and inclusion. For our administration to put on an event as such is a brilliant way to show that we are aware and are being inclusive. I would like to thank each and every one of you for attending this event and I hope you all enjoy this powerful conversation. Hello, I'm Sarah Barlow. I currently serve as the Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs at Baton Rouge Community College. We are so happy you have joined us today for this important panel on diversity, equity, and inclusion. BRCC is committed to meeting every community member where they are at. I'm also happy to introduce Mr. John Daniel, Director of the Center for Undergraduate Student Achievement. Hello, my name is John Daniel, and welcome to Fireside Chat, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Colleges in a COVID-19 Environment. It is truly our pleasure to welcome you to an event that we think is monumental. Let me tell you a little bit about the Center for Undergraduate Student Achievement and BRCC. Our focus is to outreach, to retain, to help students persist and go on to graduate, utilizing the services that are wraparound, 
Indeed, we offer intrusive advising. We offer the kind of peer and student and faculty mentoring that helps a student persist. What we are doing today is to help people understand that in order to be their best, they have to be able to access knowledge about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I'd say to this to our students and to all students of the country, let this be your college. Let this be your city. Let this be your state. Let this be your country, America. Let this be your life. And in your life, know that understanding equity, diversity, and inclusion will give you access to be your best. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Pamela Revere Jones, who is the Assistant Chief Administrative Officer of the Mayor's Office here in the city of Baton Rouge. Chancellor Dr. Willie Smith and Vice Chancellor Philip Smith, I greatly appreciate the opportunity for the Mayor's Office to collaborate on this exciting discussion series. I am Dr. Pamela Rivar Jones, and I have the pleasure to serve under um, the mayor's office as an assistant chief administrative officer under Mayor Broom for the city of Baton Rouge. To our viewing audience, we are incredibly excited to have you with us today and for your openness in learning more about this very um, poignant subject matter today that has become increasingly urgent as a topic both on a national and on a local level. And that is the subject of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have always believed that perspective sets the landscape for our lives. Often our impressions of life lead us to determining and how we actually peer through the lens of life and we look through our own individual windows. Yet we can't forget the critical point. Every window has a different view. Every window has a different view. And the only way to see someone else's perspective is if we make the effort to go sit with them and to view life through their window. You see today, we're beginning to understand the importance of the transformative power of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are incredibly honored to have a talented moderator with us today, Mr. Bakari Sellers. He fully understands the importance of looking at life through multiple windows. Mr. Bakari Sellers is an author, of the New York Times best-selling book. His book is entitled, My Vanishing Country, a Memoir. It addresses systemic levels of oppression, healthcare disparities, broken criminal and educational systems. He is the host of his own podcast. He's a political commentator and he is also a politician. I was most impressed when I found out that Bakari actually finished high school at the age of 12 and entered college at age 16. He has a BA degree from Morehouse College and furthered his education with a JD degree from the University of South Carolina School of Law. He's a practicing attorney and he serves for his firm's strategic communications and public affairs team and he provides consulting services in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. He's also a husband, a father of twins, and a teen. He has often been heard to say that he just wants to see a better America, and he wants freedom for his kids. He is not shy in having these type of difficult, yet important conversations. Bakari, on behalf of BRCC and on the mayor's office, for the city of Baton Rouge, thank you for being with us today, and thank you for bringing us into this conversation by serving as our moderator. Thank you so much. Thank you for having You're me welcome. to everyone that's here today. Um, I am from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, 
where we have three stoplights and a blinking light. And my mom and dad always tell me the two most important words in the English language are the words, thank you. And they're not nearly said enough. And so to Dr. John King, uh, Dr. Willie Smith, uh, Dr. Johan Uven, to my friend, the mayor, president, uh, congratulations on your recent victory. Shout out to Mayor uh, Sharon Broom. You are awesome. And I just tell people that if my daughters can be half the woman you are, they will be a success. Um, and last but not least, uh, to Miss Grace Sue, who's joining us as well. Uh, we're gonna have comments from my good friend, the mayor president shortly. Um, but before we get there, I just wanna talk about and, and say thank you again to BRCC for gathering us here at this moment. The reason being is because in order to have these conversations about diversity, equity, and inclusion, you have to be intentional. You have to be purposeful. And that is what they're showing us today, that intentionality and that purpose. You know, we have thought leaders from across various uh, entities, various atmospheres, various environments, but we're all coming together today to challenge these, uh, to have these very challenging and difficult conversations. Um, I want to make sure, uh, as we have our uh, guests who are joining us from around the city and around the country, that we stay focused on what our mission is today. Uh, today is a, a dialogue on the emerging topic of equity, diversity, and inclusion and community colleges in a COVID-19 environment. One of the things I can honestly say is that COVID-19 has ripped the Band-Aid off the systemic inequities that we have in our various communities. And we oftentimes see that black and brown communities are affected more than anyone else. And so it takes our thought leaders coming together in moments like this to see not what we were or what we are, but what we can be. We also have to reimagine what this country should be, how we educate our children and how we prepare them for a new 21st century global economy. Because uh, to my good friend, John King, he, he may, I think he will agree with me on this. Um, in the words of Thomas Friedman, the world is now flat. And I'm not, you know, echoing the Kyrie Irving that you'll walk the edge of the earth and fall off. <laughs> but what I am saying is that now when kids graduate from BRCC, they're not just competing with kids who graduate in New Orleans. They're not just competing with kids who graduate in South Florida or Alabama or Denmark Technical College where I'm from, but they're competing with kids around the world. And so we have to make sure that they're prepared to step out, as John Lewis says, onto the pages of history. I want to again express how grateful I am uh, to the Center for Undergraduate Student Advancement at Baton Rouge Community College for hosting this event, uh, Vice Chancellor Philip Smith and Executive Director John O. Daniel for their leadership. I do have a bone to pick with John Daniel, so I will tell everybody this in front of him. I was their second choice. Um, they reached out to Simone Sanders first, and I'm highly offended by it, uh, although she happens to be kind of busy. Um, and so uh, Simone, uh, got a great job as being senior advisor to the MVP, as we call her, the United States of America, Madam Vice President. So she couldn't be here. So I'm batting cleanup. Uh, to provide a bit of context, there she is. It's great, Sue. Got us worked out down there. It's good to see you. Uh, to provide a bit of context, 46% of all undergraduates in the U.S. are enrolled in community colleges, plus 41% of first-time freshmen attend community colleges. And I do have this really weird feeling that with uh, Joseph Robinette Biden and his beautiful and brilliant wife, Dr. Jill Biden, that community colleges, again, will be at the forefront of the discussion of how we educate our children. Uh, community colleges serve a remarkably diverse population. Um, we can go on and on and on. I, I have statistics for days. They overprepared me for this. Uh, they wanted me to talk about the broader context of Louisiana and everything going on. But with all these brilliant people here, um, everybody didn't come to hear me speak, and that's for certain. I just want to get directly to my mayor. Um, the last time I was in her office, uh, she was preparing for an election. Um, and between Mayor Broom, Keisha Lance Bottoms, Vi Lyles, I mean, all of these amazingly strong black women who have ascended to the position of mayor of their respective cities, we just owe you a, a, a debt of gratitude. Uh, to kick off our discussion, um, it's relevant to address the topic, uh, this topic initially from a local city parish perspective. Uh, Mayor, Madam Mayor President, as the local leader for the capital city of Baton Rouge, you enacted 
on June 12, 2020, the Mayor's Commission on Racial Equity and Inclusion. The commission is focused on the creation of measurable outcomes, promotion of greater accountability, and coordination of community-wide efforts to achieve racial equity within the community. I want to start with you uh, with what ain't a simple question, but one you can definitely answer. Can you share your initial vision for implementing this commission and provide a synopsis regarding the recommendations members of the commission mapped out to achieve racial equity and just share your perspective on this topic and some of the things that you're encountering, the challenges that you're overcoming and how we can support you. Thank you so much, Bakari, and thank you to BRCC and Dr. Smith and his team for having this wonderful intellectual and stirring discussion today. I will tell you that uh, Baton Rouge Community College, of course, is part of the fabric of uh, this great capital city and a part of our academic uh, trajectory here. But I established the Commission on Racial Equity and Inclusion post George Floyd, because I recognize that the citizens in our community had a hue and cry uh, for racial justice, uh, for uh, racial conciliation, uh, for improved race relations, and it was a time in history, and still remains a time in history, where people of all uh, racial backgrounds, ethnicities, recognized once they saw what happened to George Floyd, that we've got a problem in America that we have not been addressing. And so I wanted to gather people from diverse backgrounds here in Baton Rouge uh, to come together and to map out a plan of action for our city, our parish, in terms of how we move beyond where we are in race relations here in our city and in our community to where we want to be in the 21st century. Uh, I would also add that the uh, student government uh, president that you saw from BRCC is part of our Commission on Racial Equity and Inclusion. And so now we move forward with the recommendations, uh, which are somewhat voluminous from our commission. This commission will be uh, forthcoming with their recommendations in the next week or so before hopefully 2021. And it is my hope that because this came from the community, a diverse landscape of folks from the community, that they will now be uh, the mouthpiece, if you will, for helping to advance uh, racial equity and inclusion in our city and parish. Because as you know, Bakari, sometimes when it comes from a politician or public service, people tend to, you know, turn the station or say, yeah, 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 we've heard that before. But these individuals who made up this commission will now be charged with leading us forward towards improved race relations here in our community. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to open this up to all of our guests now, and I want us to just have a robust discussion. Now, I will cut you off because we, we ain't got commercial breaks, and I've been on panels where people, people just start talking on Zoom and they don't stop. That means I got to stop. The NAACP will have you there all day long, and we're not going to do that today. Um, but I do want, from everybody's particular perspective, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Smith, and then go to Ms. Grace Sue after that. How does diversity, equity, and inclusion affect policies and decisions you work to implement? And talk about this new environment that we're in, particularly both of you guys. Uh, we're in this kind of distant, socially distant environment, but we still want to have these very purposeful conversations about this issue and how do you go about implementing that and overcoming whatever obstacles this new environment um, poses to you? Thank you, Bakari. And let me say, uh, on behalf of the faculty and staff of Baton Rouge Community College, we appreciate you taking the time out to support us. We would rather have Simone saying this, but we got you. <laughs> <laughs> so we appreciate the work that you do and the activism that you do. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I uh, guess. Thank you. I guess. Yeah. Very good question. Very good question. You know, pandemically and post-pandemically has been a challenge for colleges across America. And certainly to keep an eye on diversity, equity, inclusion has been troublesome in many situations from the standpoint of being able to recruit, hire, and promote people when you don't actually see them face to face, you don't interact with them, and a whole bunch of challenges. I would tell you, though, at BRCC, we look at diversity, inclusion, and equity 
through a lens where we constantly review policies and practice here to make sure we're hiring the best folks and the right people to sit in front of our students or to support the institutional mission. Uh, one of the things that uh, we know from diversity, equity, and inclusion, we need to embrace it as our culture. And so we are community college. And when I say embracing it, means that we need to resemble what our community look like, what our society look like what our individuals go through daily. So we pride ourselves on hiring the right people from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint. And we foremost look at making sure we got the best people and the best candidates. Ms. Gray Sue, from your perspective and your perch um, at IBM, talk about some of the things that you all are doing to overcome these obstacles. Oh, am I the only one who can't hear her right now? That's okay. We'll keep it going till you, till you get it going. We'll bring in Dr. King and, and, and Dr. Uvin. This year has been like any, uh, unlike any other. Um, this is like, I compare it to 1918 and 1919 where you had a great pandemic. I compare it to 1928, 1929 where you had a um, economic recession, depression. Um, and I compare it to 1968 where in February you had the Orange Rock Massacre, in April you had the assassination of King, and in June you had the assassination of uh, RFK, and you had this racial reckoning. But we're having all of those things in one year. So as we're being purposeful, talk about where we sit. And basically I want you to, from your perch, uh, to talk about, and, and, talk, and, and from the structural perch that you all once set in um, at the Department of Education, answer the question of how far have we come and even more importantly, like where do we go from here on these issues of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion? Sure, well, thanks for the question, Bakari, and, and I appreciate Baton Rouge Community College for bringing us together for this conversation. Because I, I make two observations. One is a core challenge for addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in this country is the underlying gap in economic opportunity experienced by people of color. And you see it in, 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 in every respect. You see it in unemployment rates that are nearly double uh, for African Americans, what they are for white folks. You see it in the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 economic crisis on Black and Latino families in particular. Uh, there are some 40% of Black and Latino families report that they are struggling to provide meals for their kids. Think about what that tells us. We have a staggering racial wealth gap in this country, which ties back to our, to our earliest history around the institution of slavery and Jim Crow. So we can't solve diversity, equity, and inclusion unless we close those economic opportunity gaps. And we can't do that unless we close the educational opportunity gaps that we have. And as a country, and that's the second observation, as a country, we still provide the least to the students who need the most. Low-income students, students of color, get less access to quality early childhood education. The schools that they, that they attend are funded at a significantly lower level. They are less likely to get access to the strongest teachers, less likely to get access to advanced coursework like AP classes or algebra in eighth grade or career and tech ed classes that will prepare them for good 21st century jobs. They are less likely to get support on the transition to college. And when they get to college, they are less likely um, to succeed there because again, we under invest in the very institutions that serve the largest numbers of low-income students and students of color. So we know students of color disproportionately attend our community colleges, our historically black colleges and universities, our minority serving institutions. And those institutions, because of systemic racism, have less resources, get less resources from the state. So we need really, to your point, we should, if we think about this in historical context, we need this to be a New Deal moment Whereas a country, we say it's not good enough to go back to February 2020, which was an unjust, unequal environment. We have to actually build a more just future, and we need public policy that aligns to that. Dr. Uvin. I mean, the only thing that I would add here is that um, COVID has sort of masked the fact that this enormous transformation is happening in our economy due to automation and rapid technological advancements 
And globally, we know that <clears throat> about 75 million jobs will be eliminated. <clears throat> about 128 to 130 million new jobs will be created. But we also know that many, many folks don't actually have access to the opportunities to develop the skills that they will need to take advantage of these newly created jobs. And COVID has sort of masked this. And when we look at how that is beginning to play out, we actually see significant capacity shortfalls. We see businesses that are trying to figure out how to take advantage of the new technological advancements, but they're not necessarily equipped to do so. We see significant skill shortfalls, and, and I know that Grace will touch upon that. But we also see policy shortfalls. It's as if our public policy frame, you know, with the exception of great efforts like the one the mayor is leading, we actually see that our policies are lagging the technological advancements and the implementation of, of um, the applications of those of those new opportunities. Grace, are you up and running now? I hope so. Yes, you Can are. Can you hear Look me? Great. Yes. Okay. First it was video, now it's the audio. I'm glad to be with all of you. It's really a, a wonderful opportunity, so thank you. Um, yeah, from the, you know, industry has a huge responsibility in promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion. We can we can reform education systems, um, but if, if we're not hiring um, with a with a real goal toward workforce inclusion. Uh, we really have got to make sure that we've got the thread from school to college to work um, and build the entire pipeline of talent. And it's no secret that industry has a diversity problem. Um, if you look at the IT industry, we know there are artificial gateways. There are degree requirements from elite institutions that are unspoken. There are glass ceilings where diverse qualified candidates are just not promoted. If we look at the statistics, we know that the share of black technical workers at some of the big tech, tech companies has only increased by 1% since 2014, and it still remains below 4%, and that's simply not acceptable. One of the things that we're doing through our corporate social responsibility portfolio is really focusing on education equity and workforce inclusion. And if we're not making investments that are truly measurable and making an impact, then they're just not the right set of investments. And I think what's important for companies is that these efforts are not just shunted or confined only to corporate social responsibility, that they are company-wide. Um, IBM has a new caller strategy where we're focused on hiring for skills and not pedigree. Um, it's, a, it's a strategy that encompasses every part of the company, every business unit, IBM Research, HR. Right now, 43% of our job postings have no degree of crimes associated with them. Um, and you know, it, and it's cultural as well as we heard. I mean, we have to really change the culture, look at ourselves in the mirror and think about who we wanna be. What does it take to be a really great company? Um, and I, I think this past year, you know, companies have taken that harder look at themselves. I'm hopeful that that will translate into real action. And I think one of the promising things is that it's not just becoming a solo effort, um, but it's an effort where companies are jo joining forces. Um, just recently, uh, 110 was launched, which is a coalition of executives, um, including um, Ginny Rometty, who's the ex executive CEO of IBM, uh, executive chairman, sorry. And it's an effort to upskill, hire, and advance 1 million Black Americans over the next 10 years into um, sustaining jobs up a career ladder. Um, so efforts are on the way. We've got to keep going with them. Um, make sure that this isn't just, oh, you know, a one-off effort or a, a moment in time, but that we're all working towards something bigger. Miss Sue, I will tell you that's my greatest fear uh, that this country's missed moments before, and my greatest fear is that people will see this as a moment and not a movement, and that people that donate forty-five, fifty million dollars and will take it, but they won't have the cultural change needed. Um, to sustain what we have going on. So that's my fear. I'm glad that you're there keeping your kind of your foot um, down on the pedal. Um, Madam Mayor, President, um, in your opinion, what forms of systemic racism and other equity challenges that the city of Baton Rouge face, and for that matter, other communities across the country face during COVID-19 and beyond? 
And how can these challenges be addressed for the capital city and our country at large? I know that's a big question. I feel like yeah. I asked, like, like Chris Cuomo asking that question. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let me just say, as we all know, the pandemic certainly put a spotlight on the disparities that exist in uh, black and brown communities, especially when it comes to access to health care. Uh, and even beyond that, we understand that the disparities that exist in health care are certainly part of systemic uh, uh, institutional issues surrounding race that have lasted for uh, years. So we saw that in our community. Um, my Mayor's Healthy City Initiative started before uh, COVID-19 and did a nationally recognized community health needs assessment because it has been uh, my desire to look at the social determinants to health. And uh, these social determinants continue to uh, evolve and we continue to see them on a, a regular basis. And so there's a word that I heard in this discussion and I think you started it, Bakari, uh, but it's evident in the comments that have been made. If we are going to see changes around equity, inclusion, around uh, issues surrounding access to healthcare, it is going to take intentionality. And oftentimes when you are trying to change the trajectory of systemic uh, racism and institutional racism, uh, you will meet resistance. And so that is why I believe, as you just said, we have to capture and press in and press on through this movement and not allow it just to be a moment. If we do, we will miss a great window and opportunity to change uh, Baton Rouge and even our nation. So uh, I wanna thank you all for your perspective. And this is so cool because I get to sit here and I'm, I'm absorbing so much. And I just want you to know when you guys say brilliant things, I'm gonna go out and use it. And I'm only gonna attribute it to you the first time and the second time it's my idea. So I just want you to know that, but with the new um, national administration coming in, there's been a lot of talk about uh, building America back better. Mind you, I told the Biden team I, I didn't necessarily care for build back better, but they went with it anyway. The Biden-Harris team has a plan to create millions of good paying jobs and give America's working families the tools and choices and freedom they need to build back better. They also have plans for women and for uh, black and Native American communities to ensure their voice gets lifted. Dr. King, this question is to you. What are some of the national initiatives in education that address significant issues like hunger, poverty, and inequitable opportunities in our pre-K through 12 system? And how do you think this administration uh, can help us get underway? I mean, at the end of the day, Dr. King, and you know this better than anybody else in this country, unfortunately, you're punished many times because of the zip code you're, you, you're born into. Mm -hmm. And so um, how do we begin to unravel that through federal policy? I don't think that there's anybody who knows that better than you and without being um, uh, hyper-partisan or, or overly critical, uh, the last four years when it comes to the Department of Education has been vapid or at best, I think, um, especially with the gutting of the Civil Rights Department in the U.S. Department of Education. So I just asked you a whole bunch, just take it anywhere you wanna go. Mm -hmm. uh, how, yeah. I mean, how would you redo this? Yeah, well, certainly uh, you, your point is exactly right about the way the the Trump administration has dismantled civil rights enforcement at the education department, really across the federal government. That's something that should be fixed on day one, right? With, a, with an investment in leadership and an investment in real action uh, by those civil rights offices across federal agencies. That said, President-elect has talked about three really important investments. One is an investment to make sure we have uh, that we move towards universal access to pre-K for three-year-olds and four-year-olds. That would make a huge difference. We have decades of research evidence on brain development that shows us that if kids get high quality early learning experiences, they get to school more prepared, they're more likely to graduate from high school, they're more likely to be successful economically, they actually have better health outcomes in their 30s if they've attended quality early childhood learning uh, programs. So that's one. Two, uh, President Elect has talked about uh, tripling Title I, which is the primary federal funding source for 
low-income schools. Now, the federal dollars only account for about 10% of the spending in education. But the federal role is really a civil rights role. It dates back to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965 under President Johnson. He thought of it as a civil rights law. And so we need that tripling of Title I that will help close some of the gap between our highest need schools and our more affluent schools. It will help pay for uh, paying our teachers better. It'll help pay for the counselors and mental health services we need in schools. And then the third investment he's talked about is doubling Pell Grants. And I imagine Dr. Smith would tell us that a overwhelming percentage of his students rely in part on Pell Grants to help them pay for college. It's our primary federal mechanism to help low-income students get to college. Uh, in 1980, Pell Grants accounted for about 80% of the cost of a public four-year degree. Today, it's about 28% of the cost of a degree. So doubling Pell Grants would get us a good way towards uh, improving affordability of college and making it possible for people to compete in the economy that Johan described. Because what we saw at the last recession, it was people who had career credentials, college degrees, who were able to rebound quickly in the recovery and folks who didn't have that post-secondary education just weren't able to get a foothold in the economy. That's a mouthful. I, I wanna turn to you, uh, Chancellor Smith. Um, community colleges serve large numbers of low-income students of truly diverse backgrounds. And by the way, with all due respect to all of y'all, the baddest person that we've seen in this entire program is your SGA president at BRCC. Tell her I said what's happening. She needs an internship in Mayor Broom's office. If she needs a recommendation, tell her to call me. Um, I was SGA president at Morehouse, and I know that can lead you absolutely anywhere. So shout out to her, um, especially. Uh, but less than 20% of students in the lowest uh, household income quartile end up graduating. As a leader, what are your thoughts on why these statistics are significantly low and what should colleges be doing? And again, how will the Biden-Harris investments and initiatives be useful for example, what uh, Dr. King was talking about, uh, creating Title I for post-secondary education and, and tripling some of these funding mechanisms. And then Dr. King, offline, we're gonna have to talk about Parent PLUS loans through the Obama administration and kind of, uh, though we'll talk about that later. My dad as a former president of Voorhees College took a little issue, but we'll, we'll see if we can work through that. But Dr. Smith, the floor is yours. Thank you again, Bakari. And the question is not unique to our education, to community colleges, as Dr. King and the rest of this panel may know. So we need to look at it from two different lens. Why we get there in the first place. One is, to what Dr. King acknowledged is, we know there's been a disinvestment in poor and black and brown communities in child care, in, in, excuse me, in, in early child care, in early child development. We also know there's been disinvestment in many of the low poverty high schools and not having appropriate resources and infrastructure to support these kind of students. And so when they come to us, they're unprepared. In many cases, from a traditional standpoint, what community college end up doing is start remediating those students. Now, our average age is 25 and 26. And so you ask for someone to pass a standardized test or ACC score, and they're not probably going to be successful in that. And what ended up happening is because of the standards and the tradition of the college, we would start to remediate them. And by remediate them, those kids end up staying in remediation for one year, two years, and three years, and then and end up not graduating or completing anything. You know, there are two significant factors that affect our college students, but more so of low-income students, time and money. Many in cases, they don't have the time to sit in the classroom two and three years when they got to take care of themselves and their family, and they don't have the money to continue to pay when most, most of the time Title IV don't cover those remediation courses. And so those students are left behind. They're not able to matriculate through the college because we're still trying to remediate them based on what didn't happen in the K-12 system. Fortunately, times have changed, and I think across the country, many community colleges, but here at BRCC, we have adapted. We are an open enrollment institution now. We no longer measure student success by a standardized test score or a cut score. We look at multiple measures when we start assessing and evaluate what they can do. We have adjusted our curriculum. We have reduced the length of our program where they can get high industry-based certificate, where they can get good paying jobs. And so these are some of the changes that must take place, Bakari, to your point, in order to serve these students because time is not on their side. They don't have the resource to continue to pay the tuition and those sort of things to, to finish. 
Now, the Biden-Harris plan, I'm excited to hear about the plan. As I read the plan, there are several things that, uh, that, that entice my curiosity and hope that we get this passed. One is the investment in early child education. That's a must. The second is the value, the support of post-secondary education from the standpoint of wraparound services. Too often, community college does not have the resources to support our students with the wraparound services. Uh, the Center USA is a grant funding program. We appreciate the Department of Education for funding this program that I'm going to talk about later. But certainly, we don't normally get those resources to support those students to help them be successful. Dr. King mentioned something that we need to keep our eye on when he said increasing pay grant, Title IV. What I'm afraid of, that if we increase that, and it's the right thing to do now, but if we increase that, we must make sure that institutions does not increase tuition and fees to make that more attainable. So in other words, we need to increase the support to help with the wraparound services, support students, uh, low-income students uh, through their educational journey, but we should not increase it where we have the trajectory of being a business as usual, that we increase tuition and fees where it price students out for continuing to serve them, or else we'll be back talking about this problem for the next 40 years. And so I'm excited about the Biden Harris administration. Look forward to hearing more about the plan. And certainly, if that plan is approved, it would do wonders for the work we do at Baton Rouge Community College. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Man, y'all just, I, I paid my bills around here. I know I got student loan <laughs> paid. My, my Wi Fi, it just kicked me on out the system. Dr. Dr. Uh, Uben, I wanted you to follow up because. Uh, you you share Chancellor Smith's commitment to supporting the adult learner. Is there anything from your experience you'd like to add, particularly around the foundational skills challenges that 35 to 40 million Americans are facing uh, and the limitations of remedial education, developmental education systems to address these challenges? Yeah, I really appreciate this uh, follow-up question. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some, some numbers uh, that will put um, another dimension of inequity sort of in perspective and then maybe talk a little bit about the great opportunity that community colleges have to help address that inequity. So when we, when we look at the adult population ages 16 to 54 in our country and we take out those between 16 and 24 who are still in school at the moment, it turns out that one in three of U.S. adults, or roughly 42 million, um, really report that they speak or write English not well or not at all. They say that they have low literacy or math skills, and many of them do not have a high school credential. And this this large group, th imagine this, that's 5 million more people than the entire population of Canada. And often these adults, um, they didn't fail in our education systems, at least not in my assessment. I think our systems failed to prov provide them with an equitable opportunity to be prepared academically and not ac academically for a post-secondary experience. And then, and I was very, very, very happy to hear that Chancel Chancellor Smith has changed the thinking about developmental education because in too many instances, these predominantly low-income adults, when they enter post-secondary education, they're placed in remedial courses. And then what happens is they start using up their Pell Grants for courses that carry no credit, and it doesn't help with persistence and eventual completion at all. And what we've seen um, from the research on that is that the likelihood that you will graduate if you start in a development, a start on a developmental education trajectory is almost non-existent. So um, what successful places have done, and I'm very happy to see that BRCC and the Center for um, Undergraduate Student Achievement is employing some, some promising strategies, is that these successful places, they do not delay the taking of college credit courses um, until people have addressed some of the remediation needs that have been identified, but they, they use embedded supports um, and, and those seem to be, to be working quite well. But from an equity perspective, there's also the prevention side to this, you know, and I think sort of universal collaborations with high schools 
to start college pathways and dual credit opportunities on, I think will will go a long way to towards addressing that issue. Uh, one one final point I, I want us to consider is that we have to rethink the resources and accountability for our community colleges. Um, I'm a great believer in providing community colleges with the resources that they actually need to be able to support all students to completion and was delighted to see the proposal in the Biden-Harris plan called Beyond, Beyond High School for a Title I for post-secondary education. And I think in that in that regard, some of the work that my former colleague in the Obama administration, Mark Mitsui, has done on developing what he calls a completion FTE would, would give um, community colleges the actual resources to support all students in what they need, allowing, you know, supports for strengthening foundational skills along the way. So this way, I think, while the developmental education trajectory was sort of a gatekeeper approach. This new set of practices, and I'm, again, I'm delighted that the chancellor and the center are supporting these, are really gateway pathways uh, that uh, increase significantly the opportunities for low-income students, and particularly low-income students of color who might not have had the opportunity to access high-quality education before. Uh, Grace, I want to ask you this question because the research on diversity in business is conclus conclusive and has indicated that a more diverse workforce leads to greater ROI mm -hmm. in terms of productivity, quality, and vi viability of ideas. Based on your experience, I want you to, I know you outlined it a little bit early, but talk about the apparent gaps in the business community and other reasons why uh, businesses should diversity diversify their talent. And then specifically, uh, what are some of the ways that IBM has done this? And then is P-TECH and Skills Build part of IBM's diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy? And then, yeah. Mayor, my, my Madam Mayor President, I want you to piggyback after she's done and talk about their P-TECH and Skills Build program addressing many of the needs of many individuals in the city of Baton Rouge. Great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. And um, absolutely, we know that innovation um, only happens through diversity of thought and businesses recognize that. I think what's really important for businesses to think about and to, to embrace is, um, is that you have to have diverse talent in place. It's not enough to have employees who are thinking about um, developing diverse solutions. It's really about um, building a workforce that's diverse. Um, so that is that is absolutely key. Um, we, you know, especially now that we've with the um, as technology is accelerating and we're building solutions based upon things like AI, um, we have to make sure that we're really rooting out unconscious bias, um, implicit biases within these kinds of solutions. Um, we need people who are creating and developing these. We need women. We need people of color um, so that we make sure that these solutions are very comprehensive, that they're addressing all populations um, and getting at the root of issues that are important to uh, all populations and not just some. So some of the things that we are doing um, in, at IBM and our work is we have uh, with PTEC is we are uh, partnering with schools and community colleges to go back to that thread of the pipeline from school to college to work. So PTEC is a grades 9 through 14 model. Students from PTEC schools graduate with both their high school diploma and an ind industry recognized associate's degree. Every school represents a partnership. It's a partnership with high school, community college and industry, all providing their best expertise, their unique expertise to ensure that students are prepared to enter into new collar jobs or go on for more study. So educators and industry professionals are working hand in hand to make sure that students have rigorous and engaging high school and college coursework and also meaningful workplace experiences that not only are honing their skills, but also building social networks that we all know are really critical to accessing good jobs. So all students at P-TECH schools, they have an industry mentor, they go on worksite visits, and when they turn 16 and have some college credit under their belt, they get to experience paid internships. 
there are all of our schools are open enrollment, so there's no testing or grade requirements, and they're cost-free. So the entire experience, the community college degree, as long as as well as all the supports that go along with that, are cost-free to students and their families, so that they can fully focus on excelling um, academically and really keep their eyes on the prize. There are now more than 150 P-TECH schools across the U.S. Um, in 11 states. IBM is stewarding the model forward. We know that IBM alone cannot create systemic change. There, are, So we've brought on other industry partners to replicate the model. There are now 600 industry partners who are teaming with us to implement these schools, many working in consortiums, small and medium businesses in local areas focused on local economic reinvigoration. Um, we continue to steward the model forward, uh, want to see it in more and more schools um, across the country. And there are things within the Biden plan, actually really, um, Everything within the Biden-Harris plan is so promising, but in particular, when it comes to P-TECH, um, there are two things that that um, really ring out. One is um, the focus on free community college um, and that promise, but we know that free community college in and of itself won't be enough to raise community college graduation rates. So again, all of those wraparound services, um, the focus on connecting high school, college, and industry together um, really are creating a robust and comprehensive plan. The second thing that I really um, I'm grateful to see in the plan is the focus on dual enrollment because dual enrollment is um, so key to P-TECH schools. Students start taking college coursework as soon as uh, the spring of their ninth grade. So having early access to college we know is so important for our students to actually believe that they can complete and attain their community college degree. So we um, we're more successful in implementing the model in states that have a fully funded dual enrollment model. Um, what's key um, as we move forward is that the dual enrollment um, doesn't have any um, obstacles on the number of college credits that you can take, um, that it's very open so that students can accelerate and get to the degree attainment quickly, um, and that also there's no um, artificial requirements about when students can begin to take college coursework, that as soon as they demonstrate readiness, they can begin to take a mix of high school and college coursework. So that's what I'm hoping will happen with um, dual enrollment. I think the, you know, the promise of programs like P-TECH with dual enrollment is that they're very focused. Um, so you're not taking, you know, an anthropology course here and, uh, you know, and, and a, um, a English course here, it's really geared toward a career pathway um, so that the funding for dual enrollment is used effectively and efficiently. Madam Mayor President, uh, your thoughts on uh, how do you see IBM's P-TECH and Skills Build addressing the needs of many individuals within the city of Baton Rouge? I see it as a great connector for our workforce. Uh, we have an experience here in Baton Rouge and it's called the Ardendale Community or Ardendale Project where we have a dual enrollment uh, program. Uh, we have uh, our high schoolers uh, training, uh, whether it's in various areas of uh, technology, uh, medical field, et cetera, and it has become a breakthrough experience for a career path for our students. And here at BRCC, uh, they were on the forefront of partnering with industry to create P-TECH opportunities uh, to improve uh, the elevation of, of our workforce, specifically uh, with our chemical and refinery uh, plants that exist here. So we have to be creative and innovative as we move forward to make sure that we have a, a, a workforce that's ready uh, for the new employment experiences that are emerging. Now, Madam Mayor, President, I know you got to escape because you got a whole city to run and you are by <laughs> far the biggest one of the six of us. Uh, so just give us your, your we'll, we'll keep the party going after you're gone, but give us Thank a few you. of your closing remarks 
uh, and then we'll, we'll let you fade to black. Well, thank you so much. First of all, uh, I am grateful for uh, BRCC taking this initiative. This is a very meaningful conversation, and I will be revisiting it after I leave at some point. But we have to understand that equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion uh, must be a pillar of any, for me, administration, uh, but it also has to be a pillar of all different sectors of our society if we are indeed going to uh, be an effective, a just uh, society. Uh, I believe that the more we realize that communities of disinvestment need to be lifted up in every sector, the more we improve and grow and unify as a city and as a community. You cannot have disinvestment as part of a dominant part of the fabric of your community and think you have a great community. And so uh, to that extent, we all should recognize the importance of lifting up communities of disinvestment in every aspect. So thank you so much for this conversation today. Thank you, ma'am. Congratulations again. Uh, it's always good when you get that victory and election behind you. So get some rest and enjoy your holiday season. And happy holidays, everybody. Everybody support that's celebrating Hanukkah. I hope you have a great celebration and um, happy holidays to you, uh, Madam Mayor President. Uh, Dr. King, you are quite familiar with the Title I in pre in pre K 12. Explain to us, just break it down for us. What are the key features of this title and what conceptually is transferable to post-secondary education? I know we mentioned it a couple of times, but let's kind of dig into it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea behind Title I is to try to build the capacity of the schools that are serving the highest need students. So we're assessing you know, who are the students who are low income, which schools are they in, and then allocating resources to those schools so that they have the dollars to support uh, additional teachers, additional services, uh, wraparound services for their students. And the idea behind a, a Title I for higher ed is similar. It's saying we know there are a subset of institutions that serve the largest numbers of low-income students, uh, vulnerable students. These are the students who are most at risk of not graduating. So let's add additional resources to those institutions and get them uh, what they need to provide the kinds of uh, supports that Baton Rouge Community College is trying to, to provide to their students. Additional advising, additional tutoring, uh, just-in-time emergency aid so that if somebody's car breaks down, they don't have to drop out of college, they can get a small grant and then stay enrolled. Uh, providing students with assistance with uh, issues like housing insecurity, food insecurity, childcare, 20% you know, of our college students are also parents. Childcare costs are a huge challenge. So if institutions can help with childcare, that can make a big difference in students' ability to stay in school and graduate. And the one thing I'll observe about Title I is the, the, the idea was that states would then step up and also put more resources towards their highest need schools. And unfortunately, that's very varied across the country. There are some states that really do put more resources into their highest needs school districts. There are other states where the state dollars actually don't increase equity, they further the equity divide. And so one of the hopes with a federal Title I for higher ed model would be that you say to states, okay, we're gonna put in these federal dollars, but you, governor, state legislature, you have to make a bigger investment in public higher ed particularly in those schools that serve the largest numbers of low-income students. What we see, and this is true throughout the country, it's particularly true in the South, you have states where the spending per student at the state flagship, which serves typically more affluent students, is dramatically higher than the spending at community colleges. This is really backwards in terms of student need. We ought to be investing more in those institutions that are really engines of social mobility. So hopefully, if this were to happen, we'd see that, that tie to state action because over the last 30 years, states uh, have been systematically reducing their investment in public higher ed. 
Dr. Uvin, I wanted to see, did you have any any thoughts on that as well as you talk about Title I or some of the ways that we can be a little bit more innovative? You brought up something today that we don't talk enough about, which is how automation is going to um, completely transform the workforce and those individuals who are going to be devastated the most in black and brown communities. Well, what do you think are some of those um, steps that can be taken, innovation that can be take, taken from a federal policy level to push forward the idea of possibly filling some of these roles of the development, implementation, et cetera, by individuals who are at these programs and at these institutions? Uh, <clears throat> just a, a, a couple of ideas. One is that I want to uh, echo what John was saying in terms of the type of support that a Title I for post-secondary education could create. And I, I do want to point out a thing I learned about the BRCC student community when when Phil and John did a survey of the students during the early days of COVID, they found out that roughly 30% of the students were not facing food insecurity. They were facing daily food shortages. And um, that for me is just sort of another illustration of the fact that this type of investment in these institutions is, is needed. Two, two other things I, I wanted to say, and, and one is building on uh, the, the state matching or state expectation that John was talking about, I think there is a great opportunity um, to do so in a way that states would not just have to look at their own appropriations, but could put in place uh, incentives for employers to actually come to the table, not just in an advisory capacity, but really as a co-investor. Um, when we think about the earn and learn models such as apprenticeship programs and so forth. They are so well suited for um, low income students because they provide income during the time of learning. There's a structured path forward. And very often there is a, a very well paying, very well paying job at the end. The last thing I would wanna say is, and Grace uh, made, made that point uh, implicitly and explicitly is that when the secondary partners, the post-secondary partners and the employer community come together and co-design an experience, it will work. So what I'm hoping we would be able to see under the uh, Biden-Harris administration is some type of uh, challenge or incentive program to really incentivize leaders in secondary, post-secondary and the employer community to come together, not to align what they're doing, no, to actually create a, a, a pathway that would start at the end of middle school and really supports the notion of, you know, go from intern to apprentice to hire type of pathway. And in that, in that process, I certainly hope <clears throat> we would not forget about the 4.5 million young adults younger than 25 who are not in school, have no credential, and are not connected at this point in time with any training or education or employment opportunities for that matter. Thank you so much. Ms. Sue, the Biden-Harris plan also promotes dual enrollment in work study related to careers. How would this affect the PTEC movement? Yeah, I mean, again, dual enrollment is, is key. Um, often dual enrollment programs are not um, accessible to students from uh, underserved backgrounds. So providing dual enrollment is uh, key in order to be able to provide students with early college experiences that are so critical to degree attainment. Um, PTEC schools rely on dual enrollment in order to be able to provide students with an opportunity to earn their associate's degree for free. We work very closely with policymakers at the state level to make that happen, um, but more support from the federal level would certainly help. Um, so dual enrollment um, is crucial. Um, and um, really looking at dual enrollment in terms of how is it preparing, what are the courses that prepare students for um, careers that uh, are well-paying and competitive. So um, that piece of, of the Biden plan is um, one that we think will really support our PTEC schools. The um, federal work study is another piece that, um, that is a, a really a, a bright point within the 
the Biden plan, we know um, two things. One, that um, the best way to prepare for a career is have the opportunity to demonstrate your skills and push the envelope on your skills within a real work environment. And it's not just technical and academic skills, but it's also the professional skills that employers say they value more than any others. And those are things like problem solving and critical thinking, being adaptable, having strong communication skills, building your leadership skills are the things that with technology changing so rapidly are the kinds of skills that employers are looking for because we don't even know what the jobs of the future will precisely look like look like. And um, as Johan said, you know, AI is changing everything, technology is changing everything, automation uh, means that everybody's job is going to change. So uh, we really need to start ensuring that our students have this, these set of professional skills that are going to allow them to change um, as technology and our economy changes. Um, the other thing we know is that work begets work. Um, and if we don't give students early opportunities to participate in the world of work, um, then it's likely that they're going to be left outside um, of those opportunities. So, um, you know, giving students opportunities to use federal work study, not to be working in the cafeteria or to be checking IDs at the dormitory, um, but putting them in real work situations. Um, and being able to build their skills in much more meaningful ways, perhaps earning even college credit for these opportunities um, is going to be a tremendous opportunity and business is gonna really have to step up here and make sure that we're providing the opportunities for young people um, to come into our offices and um, be immersed within teams and get to work on real substantive projects. Thank you so much for that. You know, uh, throughout this uh, last hour and some change, many themes have emerged um, from Dr. King's uh, echoing the, the kind of fierce urgency of now to quote King and tackling some of these challenges that we're facing and how this is an amazing opportunity. Uh, Ms. Sue outlining how corporate America has a role to play and has to step up now and meet that moment. Uh, Dr. Smith, of course, talking about putting his shoulder to the wheel to, to, to bring us collectively out of a ditch um, utilizing his institution and Dr. Uven uh, laying forth the foundation of new challenges that, lay, that lie ahead as well when we're talking about automation and how we have to be bold. I hate people to think small and Dr. Uven's reminding us that we got to dream big. And of course, the mayor tackling these things on a, on a daily basis. Um, I want to wrap up, and but I want to give everybody a, a moment to say their kind of final thoughts along this issue. It's kind of kind of wild because um, uh, uh, I got a, I got a, uh, a, some closing remarks from, uh, from Dr. Daniel, from John Daniel. Um, and I met with Mr. Smith yesterday and I see that they wanted me to quote, um, from a promised land from Barack Obama's new book, but I know good and well, neither one of them read all 700 pages of that book. So I'm not going to utilize, uh, that quote that they gave me there, but what I am going to say is that we have a long way to go in this in this journey of diversity, equity, inclusion, and we got to make sure uh, that we remain steadfast, intentional, and purposeful. Dr. Smith, I'll allow you to start uh, with the closing. I'll go to Ms. Sue next, Dr. Uvin, and Dr. King. I would like for you to close us out, if you don't mind. Appreciate the dialogue with Dr. King, Johan, the mayor, and greeting you too, Grace. Uh, I'm excited to lead BRCC post-pandemically, but certainly uh, to, to support our fields in diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm excited about the work that our Center USA staff and the leadership on the field, Smith and John Daniels are doing. The support service that we provide our students in this grant funding program has to be replicated and has to be across our entire college in order for students to succeed. When I arrived at BRCC two years ago, I walked into a packed room because Cheryl dialogue with me. I walked into a packed room, and the program was supposed to serve black students. But when I looked out, I saw a lot of Hispanic students, white students, women, 
men, a whole diversity group of students seeking support. And so that let me know that the institution of BRCC is special. That's something we need to do to replicate this program across this, 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 this college. But certainly the Byers Harris plan, or Harris plan is going to be instrumental in getting us there with the wraparound service they're going to provide where community partners can come in, continue to support us on our mission. I'm excited, I'm excited on the direction that we're going here to make sure that all students can see, no matter their age. We're not going to measure you by standard, a standardized test score or the color of your skin. We're going to measure how we can make sure we provide opportunity and access to you to be successful. So thank you for allowing me to be here in Bakari. Again, much shout out to you for taking the time out to be with us. We didn't allow you to be here. This is your school. What you talking about? <laughs> I guess I'm Thank trained, but I guess I'm trained because my wife makes sure that I had to ask permission when I do something. So, <laughs> I, oh, I'm trained up well too. All right, Miss Grace. I just say I'm. You know, it's I'm so grateful that these kinds of discussions are happening, um, and really ha I'm grateful too that the private sector is being included in these discussions because I, I really do believe that to move forward with urgency, um, to move forward to ensure that our students go from excellent education opportunities to real competitive, well-paid, work opportunities is going to require us working together. It's all about public-private ecosystem, everybody sharing their very best expertise with a strong and deliberate commitment um, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, you know, again, taking advantage of this moment we're in, making sure that it's not just a moment, but um, really driving from here toward measurable goals um, and benchmarks from for where we need to be um, and and by when um, and start driving toward that together. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Uven. I mean, two quick points. One is I think we have to accept that if we're going down this journey of greater diversity, equity and inclusion, it's going to be a journey. It's a process. It can be an event because we will fail if, it, if we look at it as an event or a short-term initiative. The second thing is, and I think the mayor um, alluded to this um, earlier, is that if we are committed to equity, we should make it our primary design principle. What that means <clears throat> is not just that we ask people what they think, no, that we revisit the structures and processes that we have and that we intentionally seek participation and voice to co-design experiences that can actually work in the context of the community college, for instance, why would we not, just like business does, ask the customer what his or her needs are and then be responsive to that? And I think if we then do what Grace says, bring all the right partners together, then I, then I think we can make significant progress down on this journey. Dr. King. Yeah, well, again, thank you to BRCC for bringing us together. I, I wanna close on a sort of provocative point that goes back to something you said early on in the conversation, Bakari, about um, movement rather than a moment. I, I would say in the spring, we saw a lot of what I would characterize as performative wokeness, a lot of statements about people's commitment to racial justice, but I am interested in policy wokeness. And what I wanna know is how does the substance line up with that rhetoric? And I appreciate that IBM as a, as a private sector employer has stepped up with P-TECH to create these partnerships with community colleges to serve high need students. But we don't see enough of that from the private sector, enough stepping up. I think about what Microsoft did in Washington State, where Microsoft mobilized the business community around a higher tax on the business community that, that, that hires high-skilled workers. And the purpose of that tax was to, to directly fund community colleges, apprenticeship programs, and a, the most equity-focused free college program in the country. That was a business community saying, tax us more because we know this is important to our long-term future. Similarly, we need the state legislature to step up. 
In Louisiana, to me, that means investing in dual enrollment programs so that every high school student in the state knows they can take college courses while in high school and get started on the path to college. And then at the federal level, and look, you, you know this, Bakar, you talk about this all the time on, on, on cable news. The administration has put forth, the Biden-Harris administration has put forth this ambitious agenda, but Congress will need to enact that agenda. And that's going to be a challenge. And so we need members of Congress in both parties to step up and say, if we want a robust economic recovery in this country, we have to invest in public higher education as a vehicle for social mobility. And all of us have to mobilize as citizens to put pressure on members of Congress to get that done. Well, I think that Dr. King just highlighted a point that I was gonna make as we wrap up that the most important day we have in the future is January 5th. Because if you want Congress to do anything, January 5th and the state of Georgia has to be on your mind or else it ain't happening. So with that being said, I wanna say happy holidays to everyone. I hope everyone stays healthy and one thing that I always focus on is coming out of this uh, quarantine period, this COVID period, work as hard as you can to come out of this side um, stronger mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally than you went in. God bless you all. Thank you particularly to Baton Rouge Community College, everyone who put on this program. God bless, and I'll meet you all at the top. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.